Well, Jennifer, first, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to be here, Chris. It's going to be great. So I want to start here. What would you tell a boomer who just tuned into this podcast just to say, burnout is not a thing. It's called hard work for a reason, four letter word. I used to hike uphill both ways, all that good stuff. What would you say to that person? Well, I love that you kicked it off like that because, um, you know, it, we do see a, a generational uh, difference, a delta between what different groups feel about burnout and how they consider burnout. But I keep, you know, reminding people that when it comes to this topic that we can't just bucket, you know, one group into the, you're just a lazy millennial that wants to have a more work-life balance. And we've heard that trope. When you really think about it, I mean, burnout first to level set defined by the World Health Organization as um, workplace and institutional stress left unmanaged. And it shows up in three major signs, high levels of depletion and exhaustion, feeling emotionally distanced or disengaged from our work, and then a sense of hopelessness and cynicism. And, you know, that that's dangerous. It can lead to catastrophic impacts. It can also lead to depression and anxiety. You know, we're seeing this in the workforce, the highest level of mental health disability leaves in workplace history. Uh, so it's a, it's a serious issue. And the reason why the WHO defined it in 2019 was because of a joint research study that they did with the International Labor Organization that found that overwork caused 750,000 deaths a year. So, you know, we we have to think of it seriously. And if we do stigmatize it and make it seem like it's just about hard work, well, then people won't get the help they need. And it leads to some pretty serious consequences. Mm. Could you go through those three things again? I think those were huge. And I, I think I'm going to probably want to dig into each one deeper. Yes. Yeah, so the three root signs, so the, the, not the causes, but the signs of burnout show up in right. these three big ways. And the, so the depletion and exhaustion piece, I think we see a lot. Um, we can see it in others as withdrawing, you know, they're distracted, they're tired, but the depletion is different than just being tired, like not getting enough sleep and you know, waking up in multiple time zones, like I was saying this morning and, you know, not feeling rested. It's like a, like an in your bones kind of depletion where you know, you're not engaging in things that make you happy anymore. You're not seeing your friends. You're starting to feel like at work, you just can't uh, stay focused. And you also, like we're seeing a lot of this increase of people, you know, caffeinating more in the day or needing stimulants to stay awake in the day. And then at night they're drinking more alcohol or whatever it is to be able to decompress from the day. That exhaustion depletion is pretty serious. And the way that we measure that, you know, burnout, there's a 22 scale, you know, item scale that the Maslach burnout inventory is based on. But if you really just want to dumb it down and kind of think of like, uh, you know, measuring it ourselves, we want to look at those three signs uh, over the course of a week and then over time and say, if we're feeling this kind of depletion, for example, two to three times a week, we're at high risk of burnout. Um, mm. And even one day a week, if we're feeling that we we're on that, that kind of verge. And then that emotional distance from work. So we see that in disengagement, obviously, that a lot of people are feeling that after being so exhausted, it's hard to feel connected to the mission of the organization. I like to use healthcare, for example, you know, and, and teaching. The commitment is so it's so focused on student success. There's such a love, you know, for the work. And the student is so important. Same within healthcare, the patient is so important and it's very mission driven. So for those people to be so exhausted that they don't see why they're doing what they're doing anymore, I mean, the, that leads to mistakes. It leads to increase in malpractice suits. It means, you know, kids are more violent in schools. There's these impacts again, hospitals shutting down because there's a nursing shortage. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that final one, the hopelessness, and we saw that a lot in the data when we looked at it, that cynicism is, I think, what I, I believe in some of my other fellow experts in this space believe are is this sort of the scariest stat we've seen and it's more um across the the board than any other data in you know the last 50 years really the cynicism of people is feeling like it's not going to change and so mm -hmm. that's why you see this great resignation that's why you see people quietly quitting that's why you see a revolution happening in the workforce is people feel like they have no control nothing's going to change and they're hopeless 
And, and that's what really makes me concerned about what's going to happen in the future here. I mean, just incredible stuff. My mind is racing because I've had thoughts on this for about 20 years. Listeners know this, but when I started working, um, I genuinely had a quarter life crisis, mental breakdown, needed a sabbatical, all these things. And now was it burnout? This is one of the things I find fascinating. I've had a lot of times in my life where work has severely negatively impacted me. And I've had, I have a lot of judgment on that because I've never worked in an investment bank that made me work 80 hours a week either. So I'd say, who am I to feel burnout or feel this way? But your discussion about burnout is more comprehensive. And I'm wondering how much of a um, role, how much of a role does purpose and um, outcome orientation and just like our human want to do interesting and helpful things, how much of a role does that play into burnout these days in comparison to just workload? Uh, and that's a really important point. So um, you know, earlier, and it was 2018, I think I wrote this article, or 2019, and I wrote around the, the sort of uh, the idea of love what you do, never work a day in your life is, you know, is a total myth. I would use yeah. an expletive, but this is a you know, G-rated <laughs> podcast. Um, but the thing is, is that, there's a difference between harmonious and obsessive passion. And there's really great research around this, which I found fascinating is that the harmonious place is when we have, we're modeling self-care still for, you know, for ourselves and for others. We're understanding the balance because in my startup, I went through a really tough uh, experience with burnout because my passion had become obsessive. And you see that with a lot of entrepreneurs and people in leadership roles where we misdiagnose our passion and it becomes, um, you know, we become workaholics. And so there's a, there's a difference between that. But when we, you know, along with my partners, so Lighter and Maslock, both of them were involved in the research that we did in 2021. And then I also worked with Dr. David Whiteside, who's a PhD in organizational behavior. And he was really looking at that inspiration piece as a buffer or prophylaxis to burnout. And we mm. found that that really was a, a big support for people and that if they were inspired, they had just this longer capacity. Um, they were able to make sure that their passion was more focused in a harmonious way. They were better around self-care and these other components that we were looking at. So there's this fine line that they can be a buffer and it can also create compassion fatigue and empathy right. fatigue, which we see a lot in those people that are very mission driven. And that's why we need to be aware of it so we can understand and label, okay, when is it hitting that threshold where I'm on the verge of potentially burning out because of my passion and how do I harness it as a leader for my team to make sure if they're passionate that it can maybe help stem the symptoms of burnout. One of the nuances is uh, I like to do multiple things, right? So I have my day job, but then, and, and they're kind enough to know that I do this podcast and it benefits me as a professional. I think that's a sign of a really intelligent organization, right? To let people do some of their passions. Maybe it isn't working hours because they're going to make it up elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But then you have to couple it with a lot of the things at home that we're dealing with and make that work. And I just find, I was saying to somebody the other day, at what point in life does it go from your, you know, enjoying and growing and learning to your job is to give, you know, that, that, that is this transition I felt over the pandemic mm -hmm. of just, that's what I do from when I wake up so when I go to bed, I just, I just give things, energy, time, money, attention, focus, intelligence, creativity, and that leads to depletion and burnout. I, I completely agree. One of the things that I think has come out of the pandemic has been um, a different social contract with work. And you're describing that right now, that that if organizations think that they can jam the toothpaste back in the tube, they can't because we have a different frame of reference. We face our mortality. We have different 
identifications with work. But I also think that we've created this toxic productivity because one of the things I wrote about pre-pandemic was this indebted servitude that a lot of remote workers feel. And that was only 4% of the global workforce. It spiked to 35% overnight, basically. So at that time, a lot of people felt like the luxury of working from home meant indebted servitude and having to work all the time and really appreciating that they have the flexibility and having to prove to everyone, I work harder because I... I get to work from home for those people that are back in the office and really envious of my flexibility. And so we just just seen that on scale now, this, this expectation to be always on that if you are working from home, that is, I sort of own as an organization or employer that time because I'm allowing you to be working from home, which means now I get to have access to you all the time. Right. And so the giving and the depletion piece is really difficult because also we have these families at home and um and you know you're a great example of uh, a male in this situation but women were actually really hard hit they were disproportionately working 15 to 20 hours more per week in unpaid labor and that's why we've lost you know we lost 3 million women now it's 1.8 million to to um to loss from this this impact this societal impact so we need to get that right. Like there, again, you know, I, I like to say work-life harmony, not work-life balance, mm-hmm. but we need to create some idea of like, when is enough? When is the right to disconnect? When is the right to stop giving? When mm-hmm. do we can, um, replenish ourselves and create some productive rest so that we're better able to give the next day? I'm a social person before the pandemic. If I didn't do things with others, at least twice a week uh it would be odd it would just be strange and now every weekend there's a moment where we'll get an invite to something we'll do something and me and my wife will say verbatim i don't really want to but i know i should and what i'm actually saying is i want to be with these people i want to live that aspect of my life but weekends have become just survival, just, just try to recoup enough energy. And again, I I can't understate this. I am not overworked on an hourly basis. So anybody hearing this, you don't have to be, you know, um, grinding 80 hours a week or in one of these impossible professions. Yes, those are hard too, but there's so much more nuance to what can lead to this as you're explaining. Yeah. And you're, that's exactly what people are feeling. You're describing a symptom of what I think most people are feeling right now. And what's interesting is we, we have to kind of understand what's happening in our brains and what's happened in our brains for the last few years. And so I spent a lot of time in research around the neuroscience of happiness and, and stress as well. Um, Really appreciate the concepts of neuroplasticity and the intentional, you know, development of behaviors over time leading to kind of our subconscious ways of being. Um, Think sort of Malcolm Gladwell's blink, that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. But what I have been studying and coming to understand is that we are actually experiencing this surge capacity in our brain, which we can handle this acute high level of stress. It's the same term that's used in hospitals when there's going to be an overflow from some sort of big crisis, right? And you create surge capacity. And in the brain, it, it's really only about two to three weeks that we can handle that level of acute stress before it starts to kind of fry that limbic system where fight or flight exists. And that frazzled state makes it really difficult to start communicating to the front of the brain. So the prefrontal cortex where we make, you know, simple executive decisions around day-to-day life, even what to have for dinner, you know, like the the simple stuff. So all of this in, in sort of nerd speak here is that we're creating a brain fog that we don't even realize. And that makes it more like we're feeling like it's inertia to get through our day. We're working harder to hit the same goals. We're pushing, even though it feels like, okay, I'm working the same amount, but it's taking me longer and I have to recover from my mistakes or I'm distracted. So, you know, I have to pull myself back on my thoughts constantly to, to recreate focus. And, and those small tasks can feel enormous. What to have for dinner feels like a huge, you know, d- decision. <laughs> like we have decision fatigue yeah. on what to have for dinner. Yes. So all these things are happening acutely because our brain is 
doing what it does to survive that 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 fight or flight shuts down so that if we had to fight a tiger you know in the wild we could but we're mm. living in this surge capacity now for two and a half like going on three years mm -hmm. so the things that were easy before are just going to be harder and and i think just labeling like that 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 understanding that our brains are very fatigued it makes it difficult for us to do things that are good for us um, and it requires more motivation. There's more inertia that's going to create barriers. I think that helps you to understand why you're feeling like that and giving yourself compassion and grace, that self-compassion to be okay with it. But then also doing what you do is recognizing that once you go out and spend time with those people, usually it does fill your bucket. And so it might be harder to motivate, but those things that we're doing do fill us up if we can kind of push through. Exactly. Uh, and it takes a while to recognize that, especially internally. I want to go back to something you said, the hopelessness and cynicism. And you said cynicism is something we're seeing more of, more than we even anticipated, this idea that uh, it's not going to change. I wish I could say I felt differently, but I truly believe that it will not change until the shift is so massive. It's... Um, it's earth changing it's uh economic uh, revolution i mean i just truly believe and i'm i'm saying this because i'm hoping you can show me a different perspective but um that capitalism and what we're seeing with corporate greed co corporate profits consumerism a lack of willingness to understand what matters is pushing this narrative that every company has to grow exponentially as fast as possible to create shareholder value. Most of these shareholders are with the 1% anyways, and the profit is not funneling down. So we're not living better lives. Oh, and in order to do that, we have to work harder and more efficiently. This do more with less is all I've known as a professional. Why can we say it's going to change? I just don't think it will. It, it's you're totally fair in that. And I go back and forth in what I'm seeing right now, this this optimism and then this pessimism. It's always battling each other because in some areas I see real potential for growth. We have more, you know, teletherapy options inside of our programming right now, which were never there before. We have for the first time in you know, the history of the, the global health movement, we have standards and policies that the WHO finally came out with. And even the US Surgeon General in the US has finally come up with standards around mental health safety at work. In 1804 was the first time that there was a physical health safety standard. It took until 2013 for Canada to be the first to actually come up with a mental health safety standard. So it was two centuries before that happened. And it's the first time ever now um, that we're talking about it in the U.S. and globally. Um, and it's interesting when you talk about productivity, we are 430 percent more productive than like that's really what's happening. And so if you actually equated that to how many hours per week the average person should work, it should really be 10 hours per week that we should there work if we want to have, you know, equivalent productivity. So you're talking about more with less, like it's dramatic mm -hmm. how much yeah. more is expected. And so all of this, you know, there's, like I said, there's the dialectical theory of opposites. Two things can be true at the same time. And I think there's a lot of organizations that keep saying growth at all costs, innovate or die, you know, that, they're not realizing that it's unsustainable, that they're really excited because they can say, well, we hired 6,000 new people this year, but they're not saying, well, we had to rehire 3,000 people that left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is the actual desire is to have a sustainable workforce is to make sure that they, uh, you know, you're keeping talent. We're losing people out of their entire fields and their sectors. They're moving from say healthcare into, you know, running their own company and, quilting businesses instead of being a physician. I mean, yeah. that's some pretty serious impacts on global health and our economy. And that's where I think we're seeing some changes. We're seeing some discussions. But until we actually have real policy, real laws, that government intervenes, that we have paid leave and some of these other things that have to happen, we're still going to see, you know, some 
many organizations take advantage of the employee um, until the whole system breaks. Right. And that, and that's exactly what I think we're seeing is when you have people going from being a doctor to, you know, whatever else it is, or a teacher to whatever else it is and saying, you know what, I'll take that pay cut or I'll take that student debt on or whatever it is simply because this is untenable. I, this is what I see happening. We know there's a war for talent. We lost X amount of our good people. So now what we're going to do is we're going to only backfill 50% of them. And we're going to put that remaining work on those that have stayed. And those that have stayed can, you know, either show up or et cetera, leave. And they'll continue to backfill less and less and also less quality, but expect the same results until there is this collapse. But they are not incentivized to prevent this collapse because nobody has a timeline longer than a few years. It's just not what anyone is incentivized for. The, and that's why I talk and I've been really pushing towards considering different types of policy and, and laws and protection and those the, like worker rights. That's why we're seeing this increase in uni unionization, which no company wants. I mean, they don't right. really want to have that disconnect from their employee. But the rise of unions happened again, you know, seven, in the 70s because of just poor treatment and and will create this resurge of those types of practices if organizations aren't more focused on the root causes. You know, examples of laws like right to disconnect policy in Canada. Now they have that where an employee can sue their employer if they contact them after designated work hours. Wow. And that, you know, started in France in 2016 and has grown in interest, you know, in interest across countries in the UK, but Canada has now adopted it. This seems radical, but these types of policies make it so that and laws make it so that we have to live within the guidelines and standards and policies are good in that it creates a framework but unless you know companies are are sort of focused on uh delivering them because if not it's unlawful you know that's yeah. where it will change and so we we have i would love to say that if you know, if leaders just and organizations just followed sort of grandma's rules, we would all be fine. Human centered mm -hmm. leadership. If, if yeah. they just wanted to behave that way, that would be one of the best shifts of all time. And some companies are doing a great job of that. But we maybe to, you know, swing the pendulum where it needs to rightly sit, there needs to be other factors at play, which pushes organizations to say, you know, that they can't treat people in this way, that there's a relationship with our workforce that's so important and so critical that if it falls apart, uh, everyone's going to lose. Yeah. And we're going to talk about what we can do about this, but this topic is the one that fascinates me. If you're listening and there are plenty of people who want the counter argument of look like America is this economic powerhouse because of our entrepreneurial drive and our ability to grind and roll up our sleeves. My counter to that is always, but is your life better today, right? And for so many people, the answer to that is no. Even if you have more money, the answer to that is vastly no. And I'm talking across the board, not just in what you have, but your health, your longevity, your relationships, your happiness. So yeah, we might be more productive at building widgets, but who is benefiting from those widgets? I, I love that you're saying this. There's been this article that I've been, you know, just fascinated by the response to it. It's become really popular, this mom talking about how you make CEOs and doctors and how you raise kids to be CEOs and doctors. And, you know, everyone's really excited to read about how she did it. And and the thing is, is her suggestions are, fan, you know, really great, helping them to be independent, et cetera. But the, the way that we look at, you know, that we're going to build all of our kids into be CEOs as some sort of, I don't know, like the, the big, the big kind of goal in life is to make all of our kids CEOs instead of saying why, like how to make your kids live a fulfilling and healthy and happy life. Like yeah. that should be the Mecca. That should be the, the big Nirvana moment. And, and, and we still have really baked in ideas of what is success? What does success look like for ourselves and others? 
And in, until we start to see that that's really nuanced and people like the reason why I use the quilting example is because my mom was a nurse practitioner and quit mm -hmm. because she was burned out and started a quilting company and never yeah. went back. And she's a, was brilliant, you know, like she is brilliant. And she left to do that because for her, that was happiness, but she was happy as a nurse, but she couldn't be in that environment because it was just so toxic. Yep. So how do we figure out how to get people doing what they do that makes them fulfilled and happy, but not take advantage of that so that we deplete, you know, people that have that passion and maybe yep. also looking at success in a different way, entirely philosophically. Um, and, and that also changes the way that people feel about what they do, how much they work, modeling self-care for the, their people, knowing that four day work week isn't totally radical, that it's completely doable. You know, all yeah. of these things have to create a shift and a momentum before they're going to change. And I'll tell you, I think the pandemic, uh, this sounds crass. So if you're listening, know that, you know, my intent, but I think despite all of its negative implications, I think it was the best thing that happened to working people. I truly do. I work at a company that makes products. So there's a lot of people that worked in factories through the entire thing and they are struggling with supply chain issues. So I'm not negating that experience, but I say from a forced hand perspective, uh, making organizations and those in power think differently. I mean, work from home flexibility, like you said, you can't put the toothpaste back in that tube. Uh, four day work weeks. I've now heard of more companies doing summer Fridays, half Fridays forever for, you know, so these were things that 10 years ago, completely unheard of. I, I, I have felt the same way. We would have been, I, people were, I've been talking about this. Actually, I was sat, you know, in the airport, you always get in conversations with people at the yeah. airport bar. And, yeah. you know, this, this guy was saying he's a high level guy in one company he was saying, you know, I would have given up my, you know, right arm to have a half day off every, you know, Friday. Exactly. And he says, and now we're, you know, we're remote and hybrid. And, and, and so we swung the pendulum really far one direction. And I think a lot of people at work, are missing things like the serendipity in the office and some of those other things that that happen. So we have to come times sometimes really push things in one direction to get sort of in the middle, which I think we're still there. But I, mm -hmm. I keep saying this isn't the future of work. I mean, we went so fast, so collectively, so all at once. This is the you know the metaverse of work. We're we've yeah. we've went into a new you know timeline here, people. Yeah. And and because of the, sort of the rapidity and the and the, I guess the fact that it was global, it, it's so different. And so like that's we've, this new timeline means we can be really transformational because mm -hmm. it, we can look at the, the, the that work. And, and I'm writing a new book right now called um, sort of loosely titled Why Work Isn't Working. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have this really strong belief that we've been iterating on a design flaw. It, you know, it came, we've been looking at, it started, you know, in trade wow. and then, and then in farming and then in factories. And so we've just been iterating and developing school and all these systems and infrastructure around this idea that work is supposed to be within these time frames and you know, all this stuff. And the pandemic said, oh, like, boom, a big bang. And then yep. we spun off into this new course. And now it's about, okay, how do we create a design that isn't flawed that we can iterate on and make it a bit better. Yeah. And as we talk about the pandemic and the good things that have come out of it, like half day Fridays or remote work, one thing I want to talk about, and this kind of gets us into the conversation of what do we do about burnout is my frustration with the belief and often the leadership line of, I believe in burnout. I know it's a problem. Take the time you need or we have PTO for a reason, use it. Or we have benefits you can call this, you know, therapy line. Like, don't get me wrong. Progress. Yes. But I will tell you, as somebody who has felt burnout to my core, four hours off every other week or whatever, that, that is not even remotely close to going to solve it. And what it does is it puts the blame back on the person who says, man, I, I got that extra day off. Why don't I feel any better? I, I've been long arguing 
and you probably, you know, know how I feel about this, but that self-care isn't the cure for burnout. And Thank for you. long yes. and yeah, for a long time we've been putting the onus on the d- individual and it's not that it's not important for us to be engaging in self-care. I mean, we have to look at work as being a component of our lives, but our lives are still really important and us having psychological fitness and mental health and working on that as individuals. Yes. But when you look at the root causes of burnout, they are systemic. They're not going to be solved with ice cream, which are the perks when people need water. They need they, they need to make sure that we're hitting those kind of hierarchy of needs first because, you know, and, and in the book I write about this is hygiene versus motivation factor theory, which I, I love the research around this. It's so interesting, but that we need basic hygiene inside of our organizations. We should feel like, and that's really in the root causes, you know, ma- manageable and sustainable workloads, making sure there's fairness and justice, making sure that people feel connected to the values. We also want to make sure that we are um, connected to community. Community is really important in that. So these root causes, when there's a lack of those things, we want to make sure people are paid properly. You know, like mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that should be table stake stuff. But right. in a lot of situations, we're not actually getting the hygiene met. So we're, we're just pushing past that and looking to motivate. And so that's where all the ways that we've been handling the cures for burnout have been in those mm-hmm. intent, you know, the subsidized gym memberships in the, you know, the tech that you listen to rain for 15 seconds and it's supposed to <laughs> yeah. cure systemic discrimination, you know, in some yeah. of our workplaces. I mean, we're they're great if we're able to be optimizing that group, which means those people have to be in a fairly neutral or healthy state. Mm -hmm. to be able to take advantage of them. And that is not what's happening. And they also need the time. They need to have the time. They need to be supported to, to do, you know, the, the workouts that you're giving them in the gym that's sitting empty in your offices. So these are the kind of things it's like understanding what the root causes are working at making sure people are at a meeting like hygiene needs. And then, as a continuum, understanding that those perks and those benefits come way further downstream. And that's where instead we've been really focused. Um, and now we have to think about it differently. As you were going through those perks and uh, many of the offered solutions, it made me think we are applying a corporate solution to a human problem. I, I truly feel when somebody says, look at this gym, right? A lot of the companies believe look what we're giving you. And, and yeah, great. But you're missing the fact that like it's poorly run or it's terrible management or it's a toxic culture or it's, you know, go down the line. So again, a band aid over a, a, you know, a sword wound, like it doesn't work. I have this visual you're absolutely correct. I have this visual of a dusty ping pong table and it was, uh, you know, at a company <laughs> that I work with and, uh, you know, and, the, and we were, I was working at a, you know, marketing agency and the demands were really, really high. And, um, yeah. you know, and I had started back to work very early on and, and I remember there was this like really celebrated games room where everyone was supposed to go and unwind and, you know, the, the ping pong table sort of, put in the corner. It was pretty dusty. There's like no one using the games and that no one ever used it. There's, it became a bit of like a, like a, this all case encased in glass, beautiful space that looked like a pseudo storage room. And for me, that just felt like such a picture of the culture. And, and that happens a lot where there's a selling of a certain culture or, you know, we, we have cocktail hours or whatever it is. And, Mm -hmm. you know, in that whole idea of selling people into something that's not actually truly who you are as an organization. And the only way that you can actually play ping pong and have the time to do it is if all your work's done, but you know, after 80 hours, you're probably not that interested (laughs) in playing ping pong. And that is a big, I think that's sort of a, a micro example of what that looks like across a lot of organizations right now. And, we need to just get better at saying, OK, forget the ping pong table. Let's give you teletherapy for free, um, yep. you know, and yeah. access to support systems or mental health first aid or, you know, all of the things that we can provide that will actually make it so that when you go home, you can play ping pong with your family, you know, in your basement. 
Yeah. Is it crazy to suggest maybe we ask the individual? Like, I am of the belief if I'm executing and I've always held myself to extremely high standards, then say, what do you need to maintain those standards with the understanding that if they drop, we will have to reevaluate because it's it's easy. I don't mind working four hours on a Saturday if I, you know, got to cut out on Friday to go play golf or whatever it might be. And I, I think companies are still treating humans like toddlers for no reason. They they really they really are. And that's why I've been talking a lot, too, about this social contract with work changing. And it used to be transactional. I do my job. I got paid. And that was the relationship. But now it's it's very different. And we you know, when you look at the data of why people quit, the number one reason and this is the the trends data, the Microsoft trends data, but they said that it was uncaring leaders as the number one reason. And pay has always been the number one reason. And for the first yeah. time, it's uncaring leaders. And so this idea that that it they can just bump up a bonus or increase your pay or whatever that is, but not offer what you know what we as individuals need specifically to meet our own goals and also to meet our objectives of life, um, then that's going to, we're going to continue to see the trends because it's shifted. And yeah. and I think that's powerful. This is one of the things that I think out of the pandemic that I love the most is these empowered employees and, and, and an empowered, you know, global collective in our philosophy of life and work. And I mean, granted, it's in a lot of places it's changed. Um, there's still places that have remained the same, but you see it in, in a lot of, like across almost the entire world, employers realizing and recognizing that employees are are really um, driven for change right now. And they're mm -hmm. not accepting that this is the way it's going to be. And we're what I find interesting is we're starting to see this like discussion around recession and and really we're not seeing that exactly. I mean, yeah. there's different arguments around it, but we're not seeing it. But there's some organizations making a big point to lay off workers to kind of create this mindset that we're in some sort of recession so that maybe they can get the control back. I, I mean, this sounds conspiracy theory. A bit uh, no, me. I, I mean, we could go down this path and like <laughs> we're both in organizations and consulting with them and seeing it in this world. I actually think that to a degree, that's what's happening. They lost the power. Um, I was just watching a politician who I can't remember. Maybe I'll link to it. They put up this chart and they showed what is the cause of inflation? And it was like cost of goods went up like, I don't know, 6% and da, da, da. Corporate profits went up 40% and pay went up, you know, one and a half percent. So you tell me what's happening. And so what it appears like, I'm not an economist. There's other things. But, you know, if a company says we have supply chain issues, which they do, that impact us to the point we have to raise prices 5%, which they might but they raise them 20 and then still give you the 3% raise <laughs> like, and then lay people off to, to kind of create this fear. I, I'm telling you, I think it's real. And I, people who listen to the show with any length of time, know I'm grounded, not a conspiracy theorist. And I'm with you. I, either, either am I, but I'm also as a, you know, journalist and a, a person that tends to see trends. I see a, a lot of the counter to what, and what economists are saying, what really, you know, high profile economists who are smarter than I am on this topic are saying that's not exactly what we're seeing. But but you you do see, you know, an effort to control markets by lots of, you know, in different ways people are able to make that happen. But we are seeing that, I think, in the trying to cajole or regroup the power mm -hmm. um, back to the the employers buy these types of decisions, but no one's really buying it. You're not seeing a whole bunch of other organizations following suit. We're not seeing yeah. this happen across the board. So I think it's really fascinating um, when we dissect the headlines and what I, I, and I've had great conversations with some senior leaders and, and C-level leaders that say, no, employees have the control for a while. Like we, yeah don't have that control. They are in this, um, the driver's seat. And I think it's going to take a while before the shift happens because it's mental and philosophical and psychological. It isn't uh, economics based. And that's where yeah. we've changed. We have different expectations and it isn't just give me a paycheck. It's give me a life. 
um, it, so that I can use that paycheck in a way that feels good for me. Yeah, I think you're right. I can't remember who it was we interviewed, but was talking about the um, population decline actually being another big uh, part to this, which is we are not going to be able to backfill at some point. And, and I'm sitting here quietly going, yes, like finally, you know, and it sounds so, I don't know, socialist or leftist of me or whatever, but I don't mean it like that. I actually think my employer specifically does excellent things. I've seen cultures. It's, it's a good culture. So it's not everybody. I'm, I'm not painting business as the bad guy, but I just think until the hand is forced, who's going to do it? Why would they do it? You know? And, and what you're saying is really important because we seem to think that we have to give up one for the other. You know, if employers have less control, then it's going to mean less productivity and we're going to not see growth. It's actually counter to that. Whenever you see a healthier, more well organization, people that have more sustainable workloads that are more inspired and connected to the mission, they're the ones that work harder and they do it more efficiently. That doesn't mean that they're lacking harmony in their life. And all of those sales, revenue, shareholder value, all of those metrics rise. So the idea that, oh, if employees have choice over work-life balance, somehow we're gonna not see these, you know, these growth uh, stats. We'll mm -hmm. see them. It's just a longer term game and it's realizing that it takes time to build that. But when you have that in place, those are the highest performing organizations across the world. So yeah. we, we see this as like one side or the other, and it's actually not, it's more, it's, it's more um, collaborative. It's more about working together so that everyone is seeing the gains and the wins and the benefits. And we have to stop being us and them about it. Instead, start thinking, okay, how do I incorporate some of this thinking around, you know, well being and health and happiness and performance all as one, uh, one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Listen, Jennifer, uh, what an amazing wide range, wide ranging conversation. I'd love to spend a couple of minutes on the tactical. Um, of course, you know, it's it's in your book and we'll link to that. But tell us a few of your favorite tips to somebody who's saying this conversation resonated. Some of it lies outside of my control, but much of it resonates within my control or resides within my control. What can I do? So uh, uh, the tactical piece is actually really important to me. You know, I love the philosophy and it's great. We're talking kind of broadly about the problem, but uh, I'm a big proponent of recognizing this is not an overhaul. You know, I, I have this kind of concept of it as a, as a lifestyle change, not a diet. It's not like mm -hmm. we just kind of create a value and we do a big overhaul and we're going to make everyone happy this year. We're going to focus on gratitude and then everything's going to be good. It has to be that we're looking at this as a kind of a long-term strategy. It's incremental shifts, similar to the idea of neuroplasticity. It's about intentional kind of everyday efforts. And so some of the tactics that I include are things like um, having a nothing meeting. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, something kind of stupid or it's mm -hmm. like, it's it sounds like it's kind of child childish, but uh, I talk about our increase in meetings, 252% increase in just Teams meetings alone in the last year. So it's ridiculous. The meeting fatigue is really hard. Ridiculous. But how do we incorporate this one meeting that's about nothing, but making it a formula because people lie about being fine. We need to have, you know, leaders being more vulnerable and talking about their own stuff, saying that they're not mental health professionals, but they're mental health conduits. So they know where to take you within the organization, um, where they can actively listen to what's going on with you. And they do that in that nothing meeting where you ask everyone how you're doing. And then the team goes around and shares, you know, the high and the low this week and kind of talks about non-work related stuff, what's personal to them, what motivates them, what they light up. And we should be what Dr. Martha Bird, she's the chief anthropologist for ADP. She says we should all be professional eavesdroppers. So mm -hmm. we're supposed to be kind of looking for the signs in people all the time and listening in the gray area. 
And then we pick up the things that light people up and the things that are stressing them out. And if you hear it really well and you're familiar with what is available, even in your community, you know, you're you're hearing someone talk about a struggle as being a new immigrant in the country and starting this job and not feeling like they have resources. Like if we know what people are dealing with, we can then connect to them. That should be our jobs as professional eavesdroppers. And then that nothing meeting should end with what can we do as a team for each other to make next week easier? I mean, super simple, again, It's not expensive, any of the tactics. It's just thinking, okay, how do I create more active listening? How do I become a human-centered leader? How do I develop cognitive empathy? You know, that's really what we should be focusing on. Um, Also reducing meeting fatigue is a big one. So like, I mean, we're just having useless meetings. We need to get better if we're hosting a meeting to do things like making sure that we're inviting only people that need to contribute, having asynchronous meetings where people can, you know, be listening to them later on, maybe as they're going for a walk and they don't have to actually be sitting down at a chair, um, creating an opportunity and a culture where people can decline, giving, you know, people their ability to say, I can't be there. Hosts should make sure that if someone has 15 minutes to contribute, they're not there for the full hour. So they come Mm -hmm. in very specifically, stick to an agenda that's really um, concrete. You come in, Joe, from, you know, 1230 to 1245. Jane comes in at 1245 to one making sure that that it it isn't wasting people's time that's time theft you know considering kind of that etiquette around that stuff and then you know one of the other tactics i I've, I've been saying is really analyze what people's workloads are as leaders we should be better at knowing exactly what people are working on and we've actually haven't done a good job of that lately we're just kind of we're so under resourced we're probably t- taking on a whole exactly. load of stuff too and so once a quarter really we should do this analysis where everyone in our team spends two weeks documenting what they're supposed to be working on that day how often that they get you know kicked off from urgent needs that you know come at them how in many situations we have especially in 2020 we got thrown into um learning new technology or just having to kind of but through baptism by fire, learn our jobs. And Mm. we've never really gone back and said, okay, are you efficient at that yet? You know, is that something that you feel comfortable with? Do you find that you're still like hacking ways to navigate a system because you've never been really trained well at it? Well, let's take some time to say, okay, what's the inertia? What are the things that are creating less efficiencies and do an, an efficiency assessment once a quarter around what people are working on and making sure that your priority as a leader are matched to the same priorities that your, your team, like, Maybe they're working on some other trajectory because two people have quit and now they're doing things that are totally not in their strengths and they're doing it less efficiently. The more we know you know, openly about workload and what people are working on and not be afraid that if you find out that you have to just like, oh, well, I need to bring in resources or I don't budget for that, just be really transparent. Like we're going to do this assessment and I'll see how we can reduce efficiencies. Whenever we do that, we see workload decrease between 35 and 37 percent just through this analysis. And that's what because there's so much inertia, so many inefficiencies. And so pulling that back gives people their time back. It gives people their sense of well-being back. They feel like that they have the ability to show, you know, openly to their boss what's going on. So, I mean, that's just one of like, or a couple of a few, many, many things we can do. Um, But at the root of all of them is communication, listening, building trust, and acting with empathy. And if that's at the core, then I think we, you know, will solve the world's problems. <laughs> I, I just got to highlight this. A couple of things. One, the what you just highlighted there at the end, right? Communication, listening, empathy. They're human traits. I, I think if you're a leader listening, recognize you will not succeed anymore if you're not a human first. It baffles me how people feel like they have to put on some leadership face or approach to lead. Like, Nobody wants to be led like that. I don't want to be led like a machine. Whatever you think is the right way, if that's it, it's it's not. So it's okay to say things like, I don't know, but I want to figure it out with you. Or we can get to work, but tell me what is not working for you and be transparent, be authentic. I'm not going to hold it against you. Like if we want to be successful, we have to be humans more than ever. I I love that. And that is... That should be at the root. I mean, if, like I said, if we just go back to like grandma's rules, you know, good old fashioned mindset around kindness and, and listening and 
not feeling like you have to be stoic and invulnerable. You know, I, I talk about my husband, who's the chief strategist at the Y here in Canada, and he, you know, his role, um, you know, is important because he has to sit down with a lot of people and understand and pick their brains and find out, okay, what is going to make sense for these various groups. And, and he comes to it as a neurodiverse leader. And he always spells out, I have ADHD. And these are the things that are my superpowers. These are the things that might frustrate you, you know, in, yeah. in like what, how I work. And, and I want you to be able to talk to me about those things, but I also want you to know that you'll get like the best out of me if we're working like this. And sometimes mm. this doesn't work as well for me, but leaders just coming out with it and saying, these are, these are the things that you know, might, you know, find frustrating about me. You know, why that, if anything, I think that creates more, relational um investment you know like exactly you have this this ability to then make mistakes as a leader you have more support if you do you'll have more buy-in from people and i think that we're so afraid of saying okay i have these things um you know that that make me super and these things that uh, might be a drain that's way better than just having people um assume that you're supposed to have all the, the answers and then right. when you don't, because you're human, people get angry. And yeah. um, and that's what we need more is that vulnerability, I think, across leaders. I agree. And then when when if we won't have that as a leader, then we're sending the message that the people we're talking to can't bring that forward. Leadership's a hard job, but uh, but it can be rewarding. So, Jennifer, this is incredible stuff. Uh, I know the book has been a huge hit. Again, it's called The Burnout Epidemic, The Rise of Chronic Stress and how we can fix it. I think many people listening will find things they can um, align with and, uh, and, and understand and implement. Um, where else are you? What, you know, what else are you doing? You mentioned a new book coming up. I'd love to uh, tell our listeners where they can find you. Jennifer-Moss.com. Super easy. Lots of, there um, there's lots of articles and, and stuff that I put, I, I write a lot. And so that ends up on the site and, you know, just any sort of information around the book can be found there too. Um, yeah. So that's it. I'm not very good at promoting. So thank you for. <laughs> hey, I think it work promotes book. itself. I, think it promotes <laughs> I, pre itself. I appreciate it. I'm terrible at that <laughs> part. I just want to be in the work. So, so thanks for sharing the book. It is, it is a piece of pride um, for me because it was so hard to write in the pandemic. Yeah. But I feel because I was in it and not writing it from just a researcher standpoint, yeah. I was in the feeling. I think it adds a lot of richness because it's like, OK, this is what all of us are feeling collectively. And so it is a labor of love. And it comes through. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.